Uh, good morning, church. Today's Bible reading is from Matthew 1, 18 to 25, and that is on page 783 of the church Bibles. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. It's, uh, good morning, everybody. Merry Christmas. Uh, my name is Tim, I'm a member here at Ross River, and it's terrific to be together at Christmas time. How about I pray as we look at God's word together? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the joy of Christmas. Thank you that you've come to be with us. We pray that we might grasp something of the enormity of that this morning and that we might rejoice at you coming as our great King. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Christmas is a great time to be together, isn't it? It's lovely to be together this morning. Thanks for coming and sharing Christmas with us. It's one of the things that makes Christmas really special, isn't it? Being together with those whom you love. Um, I wonder who's going to be with you at Christmas this year. Uh, some of us, one of the things that also makes Christmas really hard, isn't it? Not being able to be with the people that you love sometimes, and even this morning, our son's sick at home, so Jed, Merry Christmas, and those who are watching online. Um, but there's something special about being together, isn't it, at Christmas? And as Matthew tells us about the first Christmas here in Matthew chapter 1, he tells us that actually it was all about God coming to be with us. It's there in verse 22, uh, verse 23. They'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's what makes Christmas so special, not just that we get to be together, but at Christmas God decided he wanted to be with us. And so his name, he'll call Emmanuel, which means God with us. Uh, names are interesting, aren't they, in their meanings? Um, my name's Tim, and I've got a brother, Rod, and so I looked up what Tim and Rod mean, and Tim means honoured by God, appropriate. Rod, the, intro, the, the website that I looked at had a few meanings. The top one, well, it meant stubborn and impatient. Uh, there are other definitions, but, you know, sometimes names just fit, don't they? Uh, my brother's not at all stubborn and impatient. But uh, at the first Christmas, before Jesus was even born, we're told he'll be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that's not actually a new theme in the Bible. In fact, you could say the whole Bible is the story of God choosing to be with us. In the very first pages of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, the first book of the Bible, we hear of God coming and walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the afternoon. Just imagine the cool of the afternoon for a moment, that's nice. But this unimaginable beauty of God coming and walking with them in the afternoon, God coming to be with the people that he'd made for himself. But we know that Adam and Eve resented God's rule over them. They doubted God's goodness, and so they decided to take God's place by choosing for themselves what was good and what was evil and rejecting God's rule over them. And because they pushed God aside, they couldn't enjoy that relationship with him and were kicked out of God's place. And instead of enjoying the beauty of that relationship, they faced the frustration and burden of life in the world cut off from God. 
the world we know, full of good things and yet full of hurt and brokenness and frustration. That's kind of been the story ever since. The history of God's people in the Bible, in so many ways, is so different to ours. It's thousand years ago and it's culturally different and yet in so many ways it's so familiar as you read the pages of the old testament we see a people that don't want god to tell them what to do that resent god's rule and decide for themselves what's right and what's wrong and it's a vision that leads to selfishness and pain and brokenness and death the world that we live in so we love God's good gifts, life, family, beauty, love, relationships. But we push away the one who gives us all those things. Or we just sideline him or we replace him or we just think we can get on without him. We want what God gives, but we don't want God with us. And that's kind of the story of the Old Testament, God longing to be with his people and acting to do that. And again and again, they push him away. And it's the story of our lives, isn't it? As God acts to love us and we push him away. And it gives weight to this claim here in Matthew chapter 1, this big backstory. God arrives because God has found a way to be with us. And so this morning, I just want us to see two things of what we see in this very first uh, Christmas what it meant for God to be with us. And the first thing is God comes into our shame. God comes into our shame. The first thing we're told about Jesus' birth is this embarrassing story about a virgin conception. It's kind of embarrassing because it's talking about conception, which we don't like doing in church very often. But it's also embarrassing because it's kind of supernatural and really, do you still believe in a virgin birth? Um, can I say, honestly, if if you get stuck on the idea of a virgin birth, then you're going to have real problems with the message of the life of Jesus. Because the supernatural breaks in on every page of Jesus' life. There's angels, there's demons, there's miracles, there's a resurrection. You can't actually take the historical Jesus seriously unless you engage with the supernatural. But actually, if it is God coming to be with us, would you expect anything less? Is it really that hard to believe that the God who made the universe could make Mary pregnant or do all these other things that Jesus does? But in our embarrassment about those things, I think we, come, we can sometimes miss the real embarrassment in this story, the embarrassment this caused Mary and Joseph. Joseph finds out that his fiancée is pregnant in a culture where sex outside of marriage is shameful. And he knows he's not the father, but we're told he doesn't want to expose her to public disgrace, so he plans to divorce her quietly. But an angel comes and convinces him not to. This baby is special. This baby is from God. Joseph's convinced, but the angel doesn't appear to everybody. Joseph believes Mary is innocent and takes her to be his wife. But everyone else just sees a couple already pregnant. And you can imagine the scenes and the social interactions of, oh, you're pregnant. How, how far along are you? And hang on, when did you get married? And you can feel the shame. Jesus is born into shame. The very thing that highlights that this is no ordinary baby, come from God, this virgin conception, is the very thing that brings scorn and shame. Jesus enters the world innocent yet bearing shame. So the first thing we see about God coming to be with us is he comes into our mess. Not only does the infinite become an infant, not only does the all-powerful one become a helpless baby, but he chooses to do it, to enter into shame. 
So if we want God with us, it's so tempting to think we need to clean ourselves up first. Right, I need to sort myself out before God would want anything to do with me. But Christmas shows us that's not how it works. God comes to us as we are in all our brokenness, in all our sinfulness, in all our shame. The second thing we see is he comes not just to share our shame, but to save us from it. What the angel tells Joseph helps explain it. Verse 21, have a look, verse 21. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. See, Jesus came, God, with us not to avoid our mess and not to judge us for it. He entered into it to save us from it. He hasn't come to stand at a distance and point out our faults. He's come to bear them. So remember the reason we're not living with God in right relationship with him is because we pushed him away. And here in this baby, God is coming to deal with that rebellion, coming to save us from it. You see, God with us could actually be a terrifying prospect. If we've lived ignoring God, denying him, replacing him, pushing him away, if we've denied his rightful rule and authority over us, which the Bible says we all have, then actually God coming to be with us could be our worst nightmare. God coming to give us what we deserve, to exercise his right rule and judgment over us. But from even before he's born, the angel announces the plan and purpose of his coming. It's not to judge us for our sins, but to save us from them. Christmas always leads to Easter. God has come amongst us to take our sin and shame on himself. He saves us by bearing what we deserve as he dies in our place. Jesus comes in shame because he's come to save. I wonder who's coming to Christmas lunch with you today. How do you feel if God was coming to your place for lunch? Well, there's a bunch of people in Palestine who lived in the first century who could say that he did. God really did come and eat with them. Like the family we read about whose 12 year old daughter had just died. And in the midst of the overwhelming grief, Jesus came into their home and he said to the little girl, Get up. And she got up. Like Zacchaeus, who was greedy and selfish and thought nothing of abusing other people to get what he wanted. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house for dinner. He got there and he said, salvation has come to your house. And Zacchaeus was a changed man. He gave away his wealth. He gave back four times what he'd taken because God had come near. Like the man hanging on the cross next to Jesus. He said, I deserve what I'm getting. But he recognised Jesus as king. And Jesus said to him, today, you will be with me in paradise. See, what makes Christmas so special? God has come to be with us. And he's done everything needed to make that possible. Not denying our brokenness and our sin, but actually exposing it. By exposing it in order to deal with it, to deal with it completely so that we might be completely forgiven, restored and made right. Jesus won't physically be at any of our lunches today, will he? So what difference does this make for us? So Jesus came as a man, not just for a season, he came as the eternal king, 
and he rose from the dead to rule forever and rules now. And today, he offers that same right relationship with God as we come and submit to him. Today, to bring light into the darkness, not just sort of nonsense, feel-good messages, not kind of name it and claim it, things that are detached from reality, no real forgiveness or real sin, real reconciliation with the God who rules the world, and real hope of real resurrection to be with him forever. I hope you have a great Christmas. I hope you get to spend it with people who love you. But more than that, I pray that you might know God with us this Christmas. This Christmas, why don't you do two things? One, why don't you pray? You might pray a lot, you might never pray. Christmas, why don't you pray and thank God for coming to be with us and ask him to make himself known to you that you might know him with you. And secondly, why don't you pick up one of these essential Jesuses we've got down the front and read what it was like when God came amongst us. You might have read that a hundred times. You might have never read it. In the next week, why don't you read some of the accounts of what it was like for God to walk among us, to see that you might trust this great King who's come to be with you this Christmas. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you know the brokenness of our world, you know the brokenness of our hearts, and you've come to do something about it. Thank you that you've come to be with us. We thank you that we get to celebrate that this Christmas. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.